Hi, I'm Alan, and today I'll be talking about settling the robust learnability of mixtures of Gaussians. This is joint work with Ankur Moitra. So I'll start with a little bit of background. This work really represents the coalescence of two as long-standing lines of work, which are first learning mixtures of Gaussians, and second is robust statistics. So first, let me say a little bit about learning mixtures of Gaussians. So a mixture of Gaussians, as we probably know, is a distribution of the form uh, shown where we have mixing weights W1 through WK and then component Gaussians G1 through GK. And so the Gaussians each have their own means and covariances, and then the mixing weights are non-negative in sum to one. And the way we draw a sample from the mixture M is we sample an index according to the mixing weights, and then we draw a sample from the corresponding component. And Gaussian mixture models, so GMMs for short, have been studied in a wide variety of settings and have applications in areas ranging from biology to physics to computer science. So a common problem that uh, is often studied is the problem of learning GMMs. And so what happens here is we view our data as samples from an unknown GMM, and our goal is to learn the parameters of that GMM from the samples. And so more formally, there is some unknown uh, GMM with parameters as shown, and then we receive n samples from the mixture M, and then our goal is to learn the parameters, so the weights W1 through WK, and the means and covariances mu1 through mu k and sigma sigma one through sigma k. So uh, let me say a little bit about previous work on learning GMMs. So uh, again, recall the problem setup. And now, so first, uh, we need to treat k as a constant, and this is because there are, uh, I guess, pretty simple information theoretic lower bounds showing that exponential and k many samples are necessary. And so what dependences do we care about? So we care about the dependences on D and epsilon. So uh, D is the underlying dimension and epsilon is the desired accuracy. And we want polynomial time and sample complexity in both. So this problem of learning GMMs was solved in the concurrent works by Moitra and Valiant in 2010 and also by Belkin and Sinhat that same year. And so what they did is they gave an algorithm for learning a general mixture of K Gaussians for constant k, and their algorithm works under information theoretically minimal assumptions. So what does information theoretically minimal assumptions mean here? So we do need a few assumptions. For instance, we need to assume that the mixing weights are all not too small. Since if some mixing weight w1 were too small, then you would never get any samples from that component, and you would never be able to learn, say, mu1 and sigma1. And we also need to assume that no two of the components are like exactly the same, because then, say, if the first two components were exactly the same, then we would never be able to distinguish the mixing weights W1 and W2. And it turns out that those two assumptions suffice for learning the parameters of the mixture. So now we know how to learn the parameters of a mixture of Gaussians. So we're done, right? So what is the point of this talk? Well, it turns out that in practice, uh, the setting is a little bit different. So we generally don't believe that our samples come from a distribution that is exactly a GMM, but instead the distribution is only like well approximated by a GMM. And so the previous algorithm, so the algorithms that I mentioned on the previous slide break down even in the presence of like a tiny fraction of errors, or if like say the true distribution is even like slightly different from exactly a GMM. So this naturally segues into the field of robust statistics, where the overarching goal is to design estimators that are robust to some fraction of our data being adversarially corrupted. So more formally, the I guess, important notion is that of an epsilon corrupted sample, which is, so we have some underlying distribution n, and there are n samples drawn iid from m. And then to generate an epsilon corrupted sample, an adversary can do whatever they want to up to epsilon fraction of our samples. So then we see the corrupted samples where I guess one minus epsilon fraction are like good samples, then epsilon fraction can be like whatever the adversary chooses. And so as a quick example, if 
uh, our underlying distribution were a Gaussian, then our epsilon corrupted samples might look something like this. Cool. So uh, designing robust estimators turns out to often be not that hard in one dimension, but much harder in higher dimensions. And uh, let's see a little bit more about why that is. So recall the problem setup. We have some epsilon corrupted sample from a distribution, and we want to learn something about that distribution. So robustness is particularly challenging in high dimensions because we want to get dimension independent guarantees. So more formally, uh, so what might, might we hope to do? So we might want to learn the parameters of the mixture M to some accuracy delta. So delta must depend on epsilon, the fraction of corruptions. However, we want delta to be independent of D, the dimension. So for instance, delta equals O of epsilon is fine. Delta equals even epsilon to some positive constant is fine. But we don't want, say, delta to be equal to O of D times epsilon. So there's a ton of previous work on as high dimensional robust statistics in general, from simple problems such as learning the mean of a distribution to more complex problems. So I'll only say a little bit about previous work that is most relevant to us. So robustly learning Gaussian mixture models. So the first uh, very relevant work is uh, these two works in 2020 about robustly learning any clusterable mixture of Gaussians. And what this means is that uh, basically any two components are very separated. So it is essentially possible to like label each of the points from which of the components it came from. So next, there was this work by Kane in 2020 that gives an algorithm for learning a general mixture of two Gaussians. So even if the two Gaussians overlap. So our result is a algorithm that robustly learns a general mixture of K Gaussians for any constant K. So more formally, uh, the theorem statement is, so we have some unknown mixture of Gaussians in RD. And then, so we assume the components are slightly non-degenerate and the mixing weights have bounded fractionality. And finally, the TV distances between the components are lower bounded. So no two components are like too close to each other. And then with these assumptions, we can, in polynomial time and sample complexity, uh, receiving an epsilon corrupted sample, we can learn the parameters of the mixture up to epsilon to the omega of one. So epsilon to a positive constant accuracy. And now, uh, so most of these assumptions look pretty natural, but the one assumption that seems a little bit strange is this bounded fractionality thing. And this is just because it comes from a previous work that we were, uh, it was a limitation in previous work that we were citing, but it turns out that it shouldn't be too difficult to get rid of this assumption of bounded fractionality as well. So I'll also mention there was this concurrent work by Diakonikolas et al. in 2020 that obtains a very similar result. And so uh, let me say a few words about the differences. So first is that our result gets an exponentially better error guarantee and that we get epsilon to a positive constant, whereas their accuracy is one over log one over epsilon to some positive constant. The next difference is we do parameter learning, whereas they do proper density estimation. So what that, is, that means is we learn the parameters of the true mixture, whereas their algorithm only guarantees to output a GMM that is close to the true GMM, like as a mixture. On the other hand, their result is stronger than ours in the following aspects. So they do not require an assumption on the mixing weights, and they also do not require assumption on the distance between the pairs of components. Okay, so now let me uh, talk, give an overview of our proof. So our algorithm has two steps. So the first step is a pre-processing step where we cluster the samples into, I, our goal is to essentially cluster the samples into submixtures. And what we want is that the submixtures are very separated. So our clustering has like good accuracy, but also the components within the same submixture are not too separated. So for instance, in the following diagram, we want to cluster G1 and G3 together, and then samples from G2 and G4 together. And so this can be done uh, with small modifications to previous techniques for learning a clusterable mixture of Gaussians. Now, the main point of this step is that we want to now reduce to the case where we have like a reasonable mixture, meaning that the 
components are like not too poorly conditioned and that also like the needs are not too far from each other. Now I'll talk about the main, like the main contribution in our algorithm, which is that we have a reasonable mixture of reactions. Now, what is our algorithm for learning the parameters? So the first step is we're gonna estimate these low degree multivariate for meat polynomials. So I, I'll say a little bit more about what they are later, but for now we should just think of them as modifications to the moments. So just modified moments that can be robustly estimated. So we measure these moments and now note that these moments, if we knew the true parameters, the moments would just be a polynomial in the true parameters. So what we can do is we can set up a polynomial system and set up and solve for parameters such that like if those were the true parameters, then the moments would match the moments that we measure. And now what is the, so really the key ingredient in our proof is that of identifiability, which is that the Hermite moments suffice to identify the parameters. In other words, if two mixtures have the same like Hermite moments, then they must have the same parameters. And note this is necessary because if there were two mixtures that are different but have the same Hermite moments, then there's no way we can guarantee to like learn the parameters correctly, right? And now this proof of identifiability is especially crucial because then in order to solve the polynomial system, what we'll do is we'll turn the proof of identifiability into an algorithm using the sum of squares framework. So now I mentioned the key ingredient in our proof is identifiability. So now I'll try to give a sketch of the proof of identifiability. So again, the goal is to show the following statement. Uh, so I won't worry about the quantitative like robustness of this statement in this talk. So basically we want to show if two GMMs match on their first like several Hermit moments, then their parameters must be the same. And now there are proofs of identifiability for GMM. So what is special and like, why are we going out of our way to uh, give a new proof? So really there are, the, the main reason is that this proof will be give dimension independent identifiability. So that means that it will relate parameter distance and distance between the Hermit moments up to say factors depend, polynomial factors and factors depending on K, but there will be no factors depending on D, which is the dimension. Whereas previous identifiability proofs do lose factors of D. And the next thing is our proof will be purely algebraic and this will be useful for eventually translating our proof into an algorithm. Okay, so uh, I've like glossed, about, glossed over the definition of Hermit polynomials for a while. So now I'll uh, define what they are. So first let's consider the case of in one dimension. So the Hermit polynomials in one dimension are just like the standard definition given by this recurrence. And here are a table of, here are like the first few values. Now what is important is that the Hermit polynomials satisfy a nice generating function relation. Uh, so this is shown in the expression on the slide. So let's try to understand this expression now. So on the left-hand side, we have this function of y and z. So we view y as like the main formal variable and then z as an auxiliary variable. So we can expand the left-hand side as a power series in y. And we, when we collect the terms, the coefficients will be polynomials in z. And it turns out these coefficients are exactly the Hermit polynomials. And then uh, with the above, following a simple computation, we find that for a univariate Gaussian, the ex expectations of the Hermit polynomials actually have a very simple closed form in a generating function. So on the left-hand side, we have a function of y, and then the parameters mu and sigma, the mean and the variance of the Gaussian go into the left-hand side, right? And then on the right-hand side is a power series in y. So what this means is that, okay, the expectations of the Hermit polynomials are polynomials in mu and lambda, and they can be expressed in this very nice, concise closed form via a generating function. Now, no, I wrote one plus lambda and not lambda, and this will be clear. So in 1D, this doesn't really make a difference, but in higher dimensions, it will be clear why I wrote this like one plus lambda. So now let's talk about the multivariate Hermit polynomials, which will correspond to the higher high dimensional case. So let X 
equals x1 through xc be a like vector of formal variables. Now, the multivariate Hermit polynomials will be polynomials in two sets of d variables. So polynomials in two d variables. So there's the z's and the x's. And then what we'll do is we'll plug in real values for the z's. So then after plugging in real values for the z's, what we'll be left with is a polynomial in the x's. Now, okay, so recall the generating function identity on the last slide. So we have an analogous generating function identity for the multivariate Hermit polynomials. Again, I didn't say exactly what they are, but the key point is that they satisfy this identity and also that they are things that we can measure. So, okay, so uh, we have, so for some divariate Gaussian with mean and covariance as shown, we have the expression on the left-hand side, which is, so e to the mu of xy plus one half sigma of xy squared. So again, y is the main formal variable. And then mu of x and sigma x are polynomials in the auxiliary area variables x. So then when we expand it as a formal power series in y, we get a formal power series in y whose coefficients are polynomials in x. And it turns out that these coefficients are exactly the expectations of the Hermit polynomials. Okay, so now what is the, again, there's lots of formal derivations on this slide, but what is really the key takeaway or like what is really going on is that the right-hand side to so expectation of Z drawn from G of this Hermit polynomial is something that we can measure because the Hermit polynomials are basically just like moments. So we can measure the things on the right-hand side and now this identity says that knowing the right-hand side is the same thing as knowing the left-hand side. So now we know this generating function whose like sort of parameters are the mean and covariance of the Gaussian. Now, uh, now quick note about why I have I plus sigma written here instead of just the covariance sigma. And that is because the pre-processing step will let us obtain a Frobenius norm bound on sigma when we write it in this form i plus sigma. And whereas normally if we didn't write it in this form i plus sigma, we would only have a spectral norm bound. And the Frobenius norm bound will be useful in the quantitative analysis. Of course, I'm not going to go into the quantitative analysis here, but yeah, that's just a quick note for why I've been writing things as like one plus lambda on the previous slide and now i plus sigma here. Anyway, so now uh, the key identity, so recall the generating function identity on the previous slide. So the key identity is that for a mixture of Gaussians written in the following form, the expectations of the Hermit polynomials can be like placed in a generating function that is equal to the sum of exponentials on the left. So again, the right-hand side is something that we can measure by like taking, like using our samples. And then, so that means that we know, or we essentially know the left-hand side. Now to prove identifiability, what we want to show, so again, to prove identifiability, we want to show that if two mixtures match on their Hermit moments, then they match as parameters, right? So the, in light of the above identity, what we need to show is that when we have two sums of exponentials of the following form that are equal, then they must have the same, then the parameters must be the same. So now we've abstracted our problem to sort of a problem of dealing with these like exponential generating functions. Now, the key insight in our proof is that we can manipulate generating functions using differential operators. Now, consider a differential operator of the following form. So we take the partial derivative with respect to y, and then we subtract off this polynomial in x and y. So now when we apply it to an exponential, the key observation is that the differential operator annihilates the exponential if and only if the mean mu is equal to mu prime and the covariance sigma is equal to sigma prime. So to reiterate, this differential operator annihilates the corresponding exponential, but not any others. So now uh, to give like a very conceptual illustration of what is going on. So I could have say a mixture of two Gaussians. Then when I apply one differential operator, so 
I can annihilate the first Gaussian, and then it will do something to the second Gaussian that will make it more complex, right? And then what I can do is I can apply the second differential operator that annihilates the second Gaussian, where I can apply like D2 more times, and this will annihilate the second Gaussian as well. So, okay, so now let me sketch the full proof of identifiability again. So the, again, recall, we want to understand when we can have two of these sums of exponentials be the same. And so assume for the contradiction that the parameters are not the same. So say mu one and sigma one does not appear on the right-hand side. Then consider the differential operators corresponding to each of the exponentials. So dj corresponds to the jth term on the left-hand side. dj prime corresponds to the jth term on the right-hand side. Now let me apply all the differential operators to kill all of the terms except for the first term on the left-hand side. So I apply d2 through dk, d1 prime through dk prime. Apply them all sufficiently many times. So then I will kill all the terms on the right-hand side, right? And I will also kill all of the terms but the first term on the left-hand side. However, I will not kill the first term on the left-hand side because like, I'm not applying the correct differential operator. So I will never annihilate the first term. And this is a contradiction because again, none of the differential operators are applied match the first term on the left-hand side. So therefore the left-hand side will be non-zero whereas the right-hand side will be zero after applying these differential operators. And this is a contradiction. So this means that actually the, like, par the, the parameters on both sides must be equal and we're done. So of course, there are a lot more details that need to go into making this proof quantitatively robust. Also the fact that we can't actually measure all of the Hermit moment, the Hermit moments. We can only measure a constant number of them, but I will not have time to go into the details in this talk. Now, the last step in our algorithm is solving this polynomial system using some of squares. So I mean, let me uh, give a super quick overview of the sum of squares framework. So sum of squares, we are trying to solve some system of polynomial inequalities. However, this is NP hard in general. So what we can do is we can instead solve for a pseudo expectation, which is a linear map from polynomials to the real numbers. And so I guess the way to think about it is for each monomial, I like have a separate variable, variable where I can like assign its value independently. So I have like a variable corresponding to each monomial. And then the constraint that I can enforce is that when I have a sum of squares, then the pseudo expectation is non-negative. So I can enforce, so the pseudo expectation that I obtain must satisfy like some constraints that can be written as sums of squares. And then, so our pseudo expectation is not an actual solution because it is like, has a separate variable for each monomial, but it can be rounded into an actual solution. And I guess, what is the key conceptual takeaway is that in sum of squares, the pseudo expectation automatically satisfy all constraints that can be written as a sum of squares. So this lets us translate a proof into an algorithm because if we have a constraint that is a sum of squares, then it is automatically enforced. Even if we, if we like have a proof that is a sum of squares that can be re, like re, written as a sum of squares, then it is automatically enforced, even if the proof involves using things that we don't know. So SOS allows us to translate a proof into an algorithm. So basically we can translate our proof of identifiability into an algorithm via sum of squares. So again, what is what are we doing? So we're solving for parameters such that uh, when we apply, such that the Hermit polynomials of the hypothetical mixture match the Hermit moments that we measure. And so again, the key point is that all of the manipulations in our proof are algebraic identities. So they hold for pseudo expectations as well. And essentially, even though our proof of identifiability involves knowing the true parameters, that is okay because it is a sum of squares proof. So it is automatically enforced for any valid pseudo expectation. So any valid pseudo expectation must eventually like can be processed into a solution that is close to the true parameters. And so this completes the proof. So to conclude, in this talk, we gave an algorithm for robustly learning a general mixture of Gaussians up to poly and epsilon accuracy when our data is epsilon corrupted. And we give a 
novel use of differential operators and generating functions to give an algebraic proof of identifiability that is then translated into an algorithm via sum of squares. And I guess the main question left that I would like to pose is, are there other general learning problems that can be solved with this generating function and differential operator approach? And that's all for the talk. And thanks for listening.